Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It was love at first sight. There I am walking down Charing Cross Road in London with my first love, my wife. It's July 2002, and staring out at me out of a bookstore window is this guy. Barbara and I bought him, took him to St. James Park, and we were transported back to the New York of the 1950s. The photographer is Jerry Danzig, a rediscovered legend, a photojournalist in love with his subjects. My guest is Grayson Danzig, Jerry's son and his archivist. Grayson is a musician and songwriter and works with some of the great photographers and their collections. Welcome back, Grayson. Oh, it's great to be back at City Talk. As you know, the second time I saw this book was when a friend and a producer at WABC, Pam Tai, called me up and said, Doug, I just interviewed this photographer. His stuff is great. There's an exhibit down at the Koopa. Let's go. We went, and then we met you. Now, you then came on our show on, uh, in October of 2003, and we rediscovered Jerry and some of his work in the year and a half since we, you were last here, what else have you discovered? The exciting thing is what I found in terms of letters, clips, uh, writings, his detailed information that was sort of scattered about. He's currently bedridden, but he's stable. We have a wonderful staff of ladies that take care of him. And uh, he's got peripheral neuropathy, but he's stable, and I'm able Which to... Which is a degenerative it's disease. It's a degenerative neurological disease. But he's able to be interviewed, and I'm continuing my work. The old magazines were so exciting to me because people would mention to me, friends of my father would say, you know, I, I used to remember that you had a, an article of um, a photograph of Coney Island on the boardwalk, but it was cut up into different sections. And I said, well, I've never seen that, but I knew when I was looking through magazines, somewhere it would be there. So a lot of it is about finding these right, things. Right, right. Also, just to describe the scene, you live in this great brownstone in Brooklyn, and you've got floors with rooms that are filled with drawers with negatives and, and contact sheets. It's, it's, it's like an archaeological dig. Yeah, it's, it's a bit overwhelming, but it's kind of the way that I like it, and it's kind of the way that the old Strand used to be here in New York. You know, New York is always changing, but I love the, the discovery aspect of being an archivist. It's so wonderful. And one of the things that I found that really helped me to frame my father was a letter in 1953 in Go which ahead. he declares himself a photojournalist. He had quit his job. Uh, as a trade paper editor, and he was going down to Mexico, and he was focused on doing a photo story uh, of the things that were going on down there. And it was so exciting, because in the letter he says, for, I'm taking the plunge as a photo I think you have the quote. Right. I'm about to take off a two-month joint in Mexico momentarily, having already resigned from my job. For better or worse, I've taken the plunge as a photojournalist. The next voice you hear will be from south of the border. So he becomes a photojournalist. Now, what is a photojournalist? Well, for my father, a photojournalist meant both to be a photographer and to be a journalist. He'd been a journalism major at Kent State, uh, where he's after the, you know, after the war. And he wrote for Stars and, and Stripes during the war. And he wrote for Stars and Stripes, and, and supposedly he took photographs, although I've yet to find them, but I'm on the hunt ah. and chasing microfilm as part of my chore. Okay. So, he's a photojournalist. What, what does he do in Mexico? What happens afterwards? How does his career begin? Well, he, he focused on three things when in Mexico because he just happened to walk into Diego Rivera's uh, painting studio. And, and he is. And he's one of the major Mexican painters, and Rufino Tamayo, another major painter. But what happened was he did a photo story on the only American uh, qualified bullfighter, John Fulton Short, and it appeared in Saga Magazine in 1954. And he was actually a friend of John Short's, and it turned out to be this wonderful photo essay, but it was something that he wrote as well as took photography in. And it was very exciting for him in the beginning because he used to 
really want to do both things. And somewhere along the line, he, he kind of gave up more of the writing aspect of it and focused on the photography. Okay, let me, let me just quote, because, I mean, I've been as, as discovering your father along with sure. you. In Salon Magazine in 1959, in his, an article called Close-Up Portraits, because one of the astounding things about your dad is the faces, the movement. And uh, let, let me just read a bit. A photographer's constant concern is to get close to his subject. With the advent of new, precise, faster, longer lenses, extension tubes, and other assorted gadgetry, this is becoming more easily possible than ever before. If truth is the last refuge of scoundrels, then the extreme close-up serves that purpose for the photographer. There is something about the large or larger-than-life image that is almost overpowering. And in both the the Jerry Dancic's New York and, and, and the photographs that you've exhibited since then, it is this sense of almost getting into the pores of, of, of his folks. Talk about, you know, the imagery, the faces that you've discovered. Well, for me, the beginning of the excitement came with the jazz stuff. I, I really got excited to see full faces of Billie Holiday and Miles Davis and Louis Armstrong and my heroes, who I had no idea that my father had taken. And it was just wonderful as you went back and I looked and I found Eleanor Roosevelt and Ingrid Bergman. And it was, these were American. And Jason Robards. And Jason Robards. And, and just, it was almost endless. As, and you, I can't believe he took that one. And, and the excitement of, of that focus. And uh, he would photograph so many things that the nice thing is to compare them all. Okay. We've seen hundreds of photographs. I've seen hundreds of photographs. Let's just go through some of the sort of historic Jerry Dancic stories before we get into the, the new collections, the new exhibits. Saga magazine. Some really fine photos of the... The, the, third, the third Lincoln Tunnel yeah, the or the boxes the... or the pool room. Talk there... about that. Again, the, one, the wonderful thing that, that I discovered was that he was writing stories as well as doing the photography. So there'd be these 10-page stories, and whether it would be the making of the third tube of the Lincoln Tunnel, or it would be um, a photographic essay on flying across the Atlantic to deliver a plane. He flew with Max Conrad. My father was amazing w w with his, his love of uh, flying. He flew in, in, at Kent State, so he would do those things. There was a wonderful story I just came across on belly dancers. I had never even seen these pictures, so it was so exciting to discover them. And then, as we'll see, the movement, the belly dancers contrasted with his more classic photos of the ballet dancers is really quite interesting. Talk about the boxes in the pool room, his fascination with the, the quotidian, the everyday, and seeing marvels in the everyday. It seems to me that the combinations of, of, of the movement of the sports and of dancing and of the motion of the city uh, sort of coming out of the Brodovich workshop that he was in 53 and 54 uh, really sort of crystallized itself in, in these pieces and he seemed to really be chasing you know the, the guys working out and really he he admired the dedication I think it, it was his own de dedication to his craft that he saw in other people and their, their dedication to their craft. Right, and the hard work involved, whether right. it's a sand hog, a bodybuilder, or a dancer. Right, it was all about the work for him and I think that really stems to his, his almost innate um, mission statement in his mind. He was not interested at this time in, in the shows and things. He was really focused on the work. He was working all the time. He was printing at night. He was going to school. And, and it was so much of an obsession for him to find the story and to, and to be involved. The whole process was an exciting time for And him. at the same time, he was a teacher as well, not only a student of his art, right. but, but, but an, an academic, in well, fact. Well, yeah, in his later career, he did become a, quite, a, a, quite a, a really great photographer, teacher. And, and uh, you know, he sort of bookmarked his career with Columbia because, yes, he had started his career in Columbia. In his later years, he, he definitely was teaching at the graduate school at Columbia, which was wonderful. Okay, let's talk about how the the public came to know your dad in terms of the 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 the, the, the classic ex exhibitions, the the Brooklyn Museum exhibition in 1973, which is the White Ethnic Project. We, we we're looking at we're looking at Jews, we're looking at Poles, we're looking at at the Irish, and then the, the I guess the big. Uh, exhibit the MoMA uh, exhibit in 1970. Talk about the Brooklyn Museum and MoMA. Well, the Brooklyn Museum show 
was wonderful because it united both my parents. My mother did some drawings and my father had done some photography. And it was the only show that I know in, in which they were both together, uh, which is important to me because th they were a team, very much so in the grant writing process and on the road. Uh, and still, and, and still to this day are. Very much yeah, so. Yeah, it's very much a team effort. And, and I feel. And a loving team effort. And a very about. loving team effort. And I, and I feel that, you know, he says a quote, uh, one of the interviews I read where he says, you know, I, I was on the team, but now I'm a team player for real because, you know, now I'm actually doing something. Of, of merit. Um, the thing about the White Ethnic Project that was so wonderful was before the circuit camera, which was his major passion in life, he was interested in focusing on uh, the return to individual cultures and, and bringing the strength of each culture and the, and the nuances of each culture and, and making it a, a, a more enriching place. And he would love to photograph all the different neighborhoods where he went down to Crown Heights and he photographed the Hasidic community down there and he went in terms of the uh, St. Patrick's Day, you know, celebration, and then go to Greenpoint and photograph over there and get the Polish. He, he just loved all these different things. I actually found earlier on that he, you know, that outside of ethnicity-wise, in terms of white, black, or whatever it was, he had photographed a migrant farm, day, you know, thing, and it was just wonderful because it didn't seem to matter. The subject was on stage as far right. as he was concerned, and it didn't matter if you were famous or anonymous. What mattered was that he was capturing you, and he wanted your essence. Right, and it what didn't matter if you were young or old, oh. fat or skinny. He's got a lot of bodies right. that, you know, as are, he, are, aren't in Glamour magazines. As he says, there's a lot of love in his photographs. Right. And, and really, that love has transpired because he, he never talked about a lot of those things. But he's, with the lens and going through the contact sheets, he says so much just by virtue of his framing, just by virtue of the way that he, he captures an image. And, and, and I tell you, going back to your thing about, you know, what I liked about his shows and things that he did, uh, even when it was something with MoMA, it, it was this, this legendary thing. He would go and capture these legends of, I think the Ben Liston article talks about, I'm making my own legend of America. Right. And it was just so wonderful how suddenly, you know, here was a gentleman who was, I think he was almost giving up his photography in the 70s. He was kind of, you know, he wasn't really, photography at that time really wasn't having the boom that it's having now. Photography has suddenly arrived, you know, with the Arbus show at the Met so and all these wonderful. wonderful things that are going on. It, it's just great to see photography getting this sort of commendation. And for, for my father, what really puts him on the map is the circuit. Is the circuit. You know, explain it a little well, bit. Well, let me just tell you, for years and years, and it's very interesting for me, uh, for years and years, he carried around the Good Morning America tape that we showed a clip of in our last show and the, the laminated copy of the Time magazine. Time magazine was this gorgeous double-page spread. As a circuit camera photographer, which is this whole sweeping panorama... 360 with 360 degrees. degrees Unbelievable he, stuff. He seemed, he seemed to be liberated from the old ways of seeing. He saw a camera that could do things that he had never done or been able to accomplish before. And we talked about how he first set up the camera and how it was so exciting to him because he was just envisioning what he could do. He was, he was, he was, it was his rebirth in many ways. And I think the article that Ben Lifson wrote, it talks about how the energy of this man was just brimming at that time. And, mm -hmm. and it was so exciting. And I, I know I've got some, some wonderful 8 millimeter film. And he's, he's almost delirious with, with his excitement, with the, the newness of it, because he, he loved photography. And I think that was transpired to his students. One of his former students is uh, Wanda Benvenuti. And I'm doing a project with her. She's doing American Boricua. And it's wonderful because, you know, it's the same way as we talked about the White Ethnic Project. Here's a Another student of my father's, and she's focusing on on her people, and and, and it's just so wonderful how she, this, this embracing quality happens, and it sort of ripples on a pond, you know. And she's one of the brightest ripples that we have. So okay, far. talk about talk about the MoMA show. Well, the MoMA show, of course, I'd love to have video of the MoMA show as I'm doing this documentary, but I have some wonderful things uh, in terms of still photography. I may even have a Gary Winogrand photograph. Uh, I've looked in a, in a reflection in a in a window taking, uh, and I think it's Gary. I'm not sure. It could be my father. It could be Gary. You love this stuff. But I love this stuff. This is what we show so much, you know, in, in terms of the little clips that I find. I, I love what is what, what was exhibited in the MoMA show? MoMA why show. is it, why does, why is he in MoMA in the late 1970s? Well, the, the simple reason is John Schakowsky. Uh, jo John 
pretty much was the one who anointed everybody f from Gary to Friedlander. Now, who, now, and, who uh, is this? John, I mean, you're... John, John was, it was the curator of photography at MoMA okay. at this time. And this was the first in the series of American photography projects, a uh, series but done by Springs Mills, was sponsored. It's a wonderful advertisement, and it says, open your eyes, and it's just this wonderful thing. And it was about celebrating America. And we're still chasing a book project called America at Length with all these wonderful panoramas, and I have over 300 of them. And it's, this was 12 you know, of, you know, it was the West, and it was... Excuse me, how pleased. many of the 300 have you actually seen? Because I've seen the negatives in drawers in yeah. your house. Well, unfortunately, this is the problem with grants. The money runs out, right? and you have these wonderful negatives. But luckily, technology has caught up with my father at this point. And I'm in a position right now working with, with some wonderful digital places. We're able to scan a six-foot mm -hmm. negative. Mm -hmm. So the dream is still alive. Okay. Talk about the book, putting together New York, the 50s in focus. Then talk about the Cooper exhibit. And let's then move into some new shows. Well, well the book arrived, you know, I have a film of my father receiving the book. And as we say, the book arrives like a, like a child to my father. Um, it was all there waiting for me to find it. I think this is the thing with my father uh, that I'm uh, kind of coming to understand, is he was already in his own mind and in his own, he was great. He really was. Uh -huh. He knew it. It didn't matter whether, he, you know, he, he, he was friends with all the great ones. But he wasn't it, cocky right, about he it. He wasn't. At and he, all. Was, he was, again, it's about the work for him. And right. I think that's what, again, really what he sort of identified with within his subjects. Mm -hmm. I definitely think he identified with his subjects and that work ethic. The work ethic was everything. Um, in, in the book, you'll see all ethnicities, ages, everything happening in the city. And the mundane, I mean, from, from, from the woman eating the hot dog to the beer-bellied guy at Coney Island to one of my absolute favorites, and I just want to talk a little bit about this shot, and this shot of Coney Island. And, it's, and, and you said that you didn't know the, right. the title of this, right. this shot. Well, one of the wonderful... You know, the things that happen as you discover things is, is there different names or there, there's different uh, background on these photographs. So this photograph, which uh, is called The Lonely and was an award-winning photograph in 53. Okay, let's turn to the new shows. On April 7th, a show opened at the Foley Gallery called Moving, and it's a solo show. And at the same date, there's another show at the National Arts Club where your dad's got a photo. Talk about the Foley Moving exhibition. I'm so excited about the Foley exhibition and I've got to tell you I've known Michael Foley since 1999 when I was beginning as an archivist. It's really an arrival for, for Jerry Danzig uh, and it's wonderful to see Michael Foley uh, come into his own as well. Talk about moving. Talk about the concept of moving. Talk about the photos in this exhibit and the other photos that uh, that your dad has done on moving and motion. I mean, clearly one of my favorites is Mambo Jumbo, which is both in this volume and an award-winning well, photo. I'll tell you, to start with, the picture of moving is the gorgeous East River Raft. Which we talked about at length wh which in the last is, show. Which was quoted as a Mark Twain idol when it was in the Museum of City of New Fabulous. York show. And it's just, it was in the photography and the fine arts too. It's a, it's a photograph that the, uh, Ivan Dmitri had written about and, and told my father that he should puff out his chest in the 60s. It's, uh, it really, it's the iconic moment of the ordinary. And, and I think what about moving, it's actually moving comes from an old piece of stationery when my parents were moving to Park Slope that they put the word moving in the middle of this. So I, I like to include as much of my father okay. as I can. So okay. I said, you know what, it's emotionally moving and it's physically moving, and he talks about the, the problems of movement as one of his earlier themes. This was something that so I said, you know what? Anytime I can put my father back in and step back and let him lead, even if it's by finding a piece of him that it's <laughs> just, it's great when I don't feel like I'm leading it. I like to see him involved as much as possible. Okay, talk, talk about some of the photos that appear in that, well, in that uh, but Okay, new, the new things that I enjoy that I've added, there's a photograph of nuns walking in front of the Grace Hope Mission, which is on 14th and 3rd, uh -huh. and it's a photograph that was in the ASMP City Scene Show in 1969. One of my first archival moments was me pointing at this photograph as I'm sitting in a baby carriage. So little did I know at that moment that I, I, was, I was in, from that I was in. Right. So, you know, it's wonderful to include that, and, and I also have 
uh, 30 Seconds to Marriage, which is Pixie Mizrahi, my father's best friend, Mo Mizrahi, his wife, and it was a photograph that appeared in 55 in Look Magazine, and it was suddenly now, you know, moving. It's emotional. She's got her hand over her face, and, and she's just, it's just, you know, it's a great addition. And then you've got the physical movement of the boxer, which the, the Jerry looked at athletes doing their, their job. And there's real physicality here. But then, then you've got in this collection these close-ups of faces that we talked about earlier yep. and some classic faces. We pu we're putting in, a, for me, they're putting in a lot of Miles Davis and, and uh, Louis Armstrong and we've got Sarah Vaughan, a lot of my jazz people that I absolutely adore, all my, all my heroes. And it's just, it's wonderful to see, to see that addition. Talk about the National Arts Club piece. It's one of the classic panoramas. Well, one of the champions of the arts this day is, is the National Arts Club right. and the President Alden James, who's done some wonderful uh, additions in terms of all aspects of art. And, and what we're doing, we're going to be involved in the, the PAI show, which is the Photographer's Arts Club of all the great masters that, who are still surviving in New York, friends of my father's. and. Uh, it's a group show, and I actually put my mother in this show, too. I told my mother to join up, and so it's, it, they're sort of in the show as well. I think there'll be a panoramic in that show. Excellent. Now, let's, let's talk about what I'm really very much looking forward to is the Hymns to the Ordinary at the Soho Photo Gallery. Talk about that, that show and what stimulated you to put together the show and the relevance of the title of the show. Hymns to the Ordinary. Just let me add that if you go, go, if you go to foley .com, foleygallery.com, you'll be able to see uh, an, a sneak peek, I like to call it, of the show and, uh, and the biography of my father. But uh, the Soho Photo Show, in, in many ways, is a, is a comparative show. You're putting together photographs that you know from the book of the 50s and then so unknown photographs. My father had done work in still life and in portraiture and uh, advertising stuff, and I'm really combining his, his images, and I've called this Hymns to the Ordinary, and I think you've got the Ben Lifson quote. Right, I mean, the Ben Lifson in the intro to Jerry Danzig's New York 50s in Focus, and I'll just excerpt some of it. Danzig was neither ironic nor sentimental. These are conversational prose hymns to the ordinary. By virtue of both craft and vision, Danzig makes places within the structure of his pictures such that minor and major figures alike, heroes, supporting cast members, and onlookers leave their marks upon a place characterized by a daunting, phenomenal utterness. And you're putting together, and you, you want to put together, an entire Billie Holiday show. I mean, your series of jazz photos are just phenomenal and we'll see some of them in this show and in and in future shows and on, on in this particular broadcast as well well i'll tell you a, a couple of things that we've gotten involved with um, talk about new projects yeah. we've got a minute to go talk about what's coming up in addition to these two shows well i've just come back from the university of idaho at the lionel hampton jazz festival lewis ricky and the wonderful folks there uh put on a, a show for us and we we did something called sophisticated ladies women in jazz included my father, included George Simon in the show. I did a uh, slideshow, PowerPoint presentation on Billie Holiday. So, which I've seen, which, which is excellent. Which is just happening. We, we were involved with the, um, the people at uh, Institute of Jazz Studies. Tad Hershorn and Dan Morgenstern are, are doing websites of, of great jazz people. And this one of Count Basie. We've got 15 seconds. Next book. Next book is going to be a re-examination re of the 50s book, of all those things, perhaps the Billy book, hopefully the America book, and bring this towards an educational focus. I've done some work uh, for the Home of the Free uh, program that encourages photojournalism among young students. I was up in the Bronx. My father had gone to school at Evander Childs and graduated in 1942. I, I like to think of myself as returning in my father's footsteps educationally wise. Rivers define a city the way a man parts his hair. They wander and separate and curve and provide starting points for the eye to linger upon. Where the rivers come to the sea, this city first took its life and its sense of grandeur. And on the river's edge, the manholes that manscaped do grew and became sovereign and withered and grew again. Much of my life has centered on the port and the river. I have worked high on the steel of new bridges and skyscrapers and laughed with Sandhog 
building occasional caissons deep beneath the dark water. When I was a child, the port of New York was my playground, and since I'd never been far from home, it offered much of what little I knew about the world beyond the river. Next book, next show, you're on. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Always a pleasure.